Hi, this is Frode, and welcome to the first interview in the Actualize podcast. Today, I'm happy to be chatting with Thomas Sterner. Thomas is the speaker and author of The Practicing Mind, a book I'm very glad I read, since it has gotten me more aligned with the observer within me, something we'll be talking more about today. He has also written the book Fully Engaged, which is currently in my shopping cart on Amazon, and I'm excited to read that one too. Tom, I really appreciate you and your work, and that you're taking the time to share wisdom with us today. Thanks, I'm glad to be Oh, so uh, do you want to jump uh, straight into the questions? Yes, go ahead. Perfect. Uh, can you tell us why you decided to name the book uh, The Practicing Mind? Uh, the Practicing Mind idea came to me, you know, I am a musician. I play several different instruments, but um, I learned over time that everything that we do in life, everything that we learn comes from a process of repetition with intention uh, conscious intention to accomplish a specific thing, whether that's learning how to talk, learning how to walk, learning how to read, all of those things. As we grow up, we every new thing that we learn comes from this repetition with intention to accomplish a specific thing. And to me, that is the mind practicing um, a process which it then eventually masters. So that was why I had the idea of calling the book The Practicing Mind. Ah, oh, so, yes. Yeah, so, um... If I get you right, uh, this is goes for and uh, brushing your teeth and walking and uh, everything. Absolutely everything, and I think that um, when we learn to embrace that whole concept, because it is a truth in life, then we can start to focus more on enjoying the process of learning stuff and not being so attached to the moment that we have quote mastered it. You know, we're because we spend most of our time in a process of learning. And then we, um, once it's mastered, we immediately move on to something else because the, the thing that we have mastered uh, kind of falls into the background, meaning uh, you don't think about walking across the room. You don't think about how to brush your teeth. You just brush your teeth. And you don't think about walking across the room. You just walk across the room. So because of that, you know, we're always looking. That's just part of the human spirit. We're always looking for something else to learn. And... Um, but the way that we learn is always the same. It's a repetition of a process, gathering data, refining our emotions. And I think that we have a problem in our culture with becoming impatient with that process and becoming very attached to this moment when we think that uh, we should be there and we've mastered it. And that's what I try to, um, that's really what I'm all about is teaching people to be in the present moment uh, because that is where you're practicing the process and make that your goal and make the, the goal that you're trying to accomplish son, uh, more or less a secondary goal. Mm, yeah, that's a really refreshing perspective. I uh, can always see uh, myself getting impatient and I'm trying to get right back in the moment again. So, uh, yeah. Well, I think that that comes from the fact that, that that perspective is, it's not only taught to us from the time we're um, born, but it's reinforced every day through the media. I mean, we have, you know, if you look at just something like um, grades in school, you know, we tell kids, you know, just, just try your best. But if they come home with a D, we don't tell them, that's fine, you tried your best. We tell them you didn't try hard enough. I mean, I mean, we were very, we instill this idea that it's the, the result that matters. It's the quality of the result that matters. It's not the quality of the process of working at, at the um, result. So, um, and we're also taught through the media that we are incomplete, that where we are right now, we can't be happy. We have to have this thing over here, or we have to have accomplished this, or we have to acquire that. It's always something outside of this moment. And that makes us impatient to get to this place where this feeling that we have inside is going to go away. That's one of the reasons that we struggle with motivation because we don't feel motivated to be in the moment because we're so attached to this time out in the future that we wanna to get to. And again, that all of those things are taught to us and reinforced over and over again in our life. And we need to start unlearning that. And then we can begin to see how much joy there is in every moment because we're, we're right where we're supposed to be in every moment. And we feel that we're right where we're supposed to be. We also, our performance also goes way up. And this is something that has been studied through sports psychology and peak performance studies. And we know without a doubt that when we are functioning in the present moment, 
we get the most done with the least amount of effort in the least amount of time. And probably most importantly, our experience of accomplishing it is one of, it's fun and contentment. It's not one of anxiety and feeling impatient. So you know, we know that, and that's one of the reasons why we can say, look, this, this system over here doesn't work. It's been done over and over again through centuries. It doesn't work. We know now that we want to work at being in the present moment, having a goal, using the goal as our rudder to steer us in the direction that we want to go. But if we want to perform at our highest level and enjoy it, then we need to work at being in the present moment. At that point, we have access to our total consciousness, our thoughts thin out, our mind slows down. Um, we really, ran, our performance ramps way up. Mm, yeah, that's amazing. So that's the mind is always practicing. It's always practicing and um, we can make it better at that if we get out of its way, you know, which is what we do. You know, we, we really get in our mind's way because we have all these extraneous thoughts that have nothing to do with what we're trying to accomplish. For example, um, you know, if we decide, and it's an example I've used many, many times, but if you look at a guy, a basketball player shooting foul shots, and let's say he gets two shots. If he shoots the first shot and he misses it, then he has a choice. If he decides to get angry and throw the ball and this internal dialogue starts um, condemning himself. And what happens with that is his performance, his ability to perform diminishes greatly. And all of that has nothing to do with putting the ball through the hoop the second time. So this is what I'm talking about is this is where we learn that um, that mindset doesn't work. And if you want to use that mindset, it's fine. As long as you know, it doesn't work. It's not going to take you where you want to go. So if you want to perform at your best, then you need to get off of that train and get on the one where you learn to observe, do observe and correct, as I said, in the practicing mind, you know, you execute, you observe, the, um, the process that you've just executed, like he makes the shot, that's the execution. Then he observes the ball flying towards the hoop. He makes his observation, gathers data, the ball either goes in the hoop or it doesn't. He makes corrections, shoots again. So there should be no judgment involved in that. He can analyze. Analyzing always comes before judging, but judging um, has no purpose. It serves no purpose other than to deteriorate our performance. Ah, yeah, and I like the way you, uh, Use the example of the uh, observing correct, like the archer between the Asian archer and the American archer. Like uh, you said in the baseball example, if you uh, judge, then uh, it won't uh, do anything to the next uh, try. That's right. I mean, that the story I told in the practicing mind was about the um, in the seventies. You know, before this stuff is all common knowledge now in sports. It's in all sports. It was really developed in um, sports that are non-reactive, uh, uh, like such as archery and golf, where you decide when the execution occurs. The in golf, you decide when to take the club back. In archery, you decide when to let the arrow go. You decide when to draw the arrow. In sports like baseball and um, tennis, where the ball's coming at you and you have to react, uh, it, it was slower to get into those sports, in my opinion. But if you use the example that you just brought up, um, in the 1970s, before this was common knowledge, it was part of the Asian culture. So um, there was a story that I, because I had shot target archery for some time, uh, there was a story that interested me. Um, where uh, it was in the 1970s, an American Olympic coach for the archery team was very frustrated because the American archers being very goal oriented and results oriented and bottom line oriented were so fixated on getting bullseyes that the act of drawing the bow was almost to them a nuisance that they had to go through so they could let the arrow go and see if they got a bullseye. Whereas the Asians were completely focused on the process of drawing the bow and letting the arrow go at the correct time. Uh, and they would pay attention to things like let it go in between the beat of their heart, all these types of things. They would hold it and uh, coordinate it with their breath. And that was their joy and that was where their focus was. And they just, they were just um, killing everybody. I mean, they, nobody could, they weren't, nobody was competitive against them, but that was their culture was the way that they were raised. And then the, the Americans were raised with this, you know, they'd, they'd um, shoot the arrow, the arrow would be wide and left. Um, and they would, you know, feel 
frustrated, it would, just like I said about the basketball player, they would begin to get this internal dialogue would start to happen. They'd be annoyed. They only get three shots. I missed the first one. Now, I, how am I going to make that up? Because my opponent already has a bullseye. Uh, you know, all this dialogue has nothing to do with putting the arrow in the bullseye on the next shot. And this attachment to getting the arrow in there was working against them. So again, this stuff has all been proven out through many, many tests. And it's been around for a while, but it's becoming mainstream in business, for entrepreneurs, in just raising a family, in all different areas. That's why you see this big um, expansion of mindfulness happening. Mm, yeah, that's amazing. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I reckon that the Observer was really the backbone of the book. Uh, can you talk about that? Yes. The um, To talk about that, we have to first talk about thought awareness training. And, um, you know, people ask me, you know, how do you move into this stuff and start to develop it in your life? And the very, the very core, the fundamental building block is you have to become the observer of your thoughts. You have to reach a perspective and understand uh, through a knowing that, I am not my thoughts, I'm the one that experiences my thoughts. And some of those thoughts that my mind produces, I will initiate through my intention. But many of the thoughts that are happening in your mind during the day, and there are thousands of them, are you're not initiating. Your mind is just replaying things from different uh, days or earlier in the day or anticipating things in the future. It's a problem solver, that's what the mind does. It wants to solve a problem, it wants a bone to chew on. And if you don't, give it something to work on, it will go into a search mode and look for something to work on. That's why it doesn't like um, being in the presence. It, it gets bored very quickly. And then it starts to sneak out, run off, and look at all these different things it can, it can work on. And when that happens, you go along uh, with all these thoughts. And every thought that you have has emotional content to it. Sometimes it's happy content. Sometimes it's angry. Sometimes it's sad. But there is content that goes along with every thought. And when you are absorbed in your thoughts, you are experiencing all of those emotions. And in general, you're not in the present moment, so you're not functioning at a very high level. So what we have to do is teach ourselves, and we can learn this, that we are not our thoughts. And we do this through what I'm calling thought awareness training, because it's a little easier for people to understand that. You could call it a meditation if you want. Um, mindfulness training they're just labels it really doesn't matter what you call it it's just understanding what you're trying to accomplish and what is that well you sit quietly um i usually don't recommend people lie down because you become so relaxed it's easy to become drowsy um, but you sit in a comfortable position uh, upright with your back erect and you close your eyes so you don't have visual cues happening and distracting you and you just watch your body breathe and it sounds like that's it. <laughs> it sounds like it's really easy, and uh, but it isn't um, because there's all these control things that start to happen. I mean, you you begin to um, you know when you've never paid attention to your your breathing, your body just breathes for you. But as soon as you start to pay attention to it, you want to control it, which is something you don't want to do in this pr practice. You just want to watch your body breathe. Uh, the other way that you can do it is through a, a phrase based session and these are like maybe 10 minutes uh, something like that in the morning or afternoon we're not talking about dedicating hours and hours of your day um but uh you can just say a simple phrase uh, my mind is still i love my kids well it doesn't really matter but the purpose of the phrase from my perspective in the context of this discussion is to give your mind a single thought to work on instead of uh, giving it a carte blanche to just run out and do a bunch of things. And by giving it one specific task, you as the observer can tell when it's on task and, and when it's going someplace else. And this is what will happen. Um, if you're, if you're uh, following your breath, you will sit there and it will take, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds. If it takes that long, your mind will take off and it will run in a different direction. It will go to the grocery store, it will be working on a report, it'll be thinking about something you wanna to say to somebody later in the day or something you said yesterday that you feel like you shouldn't have said. All these types of things, it will run out and start visiting them. And initially, you will follow it because that's what you've done your whole life millions of times. So it's a, it's a habit of behavior. And then because you have set this intention that you want to follow your breath, you will have this moment this microsecond where you wake up and when you wake up you'll realize i'm 
I'm thinking about something I need to, want to say to somebody. I don't even, I'm not even noticing my breath. I got to pull my mind back. And that is where all of the value is in thought awareness training, because in that moment, you connect with the observer part of you, which is really who you are. It's that silent witness to everything that's going on. So it's in that microsecond when you notice that, that's when everything grows. Two things happen. One is the observer part of your personality grows up. You're, it's, it doesn't, it's, the observer doesn't grow, you just notice it more and become more attached to that perspective than the ego's perspective. And the other thing is your willpower strengthens, your discipline goes up because you're pulling your mind back. So I'm always amused with people when they say, you know, I, I tried that, but I'm not very good at it. And you go, well, define not very good. And they go, well, I just can't, I can't quite my mind. My mind's running all over the place and that's all I do is chase it. My response to that is, well, then you're very good at it because you can't chase your mind if you're not observing your mind going off of task. You know, if you're experiencing catching your mind all the time, that means you're noticing your mind is going. So that's a good thing. It's uh, if you're just if you're not noticing it, that's not a good thing. So that's you know, that's a falsehood about um this meditation, thought awareness training is that if you're chasing your mind a lot, if your mind is very active, then you're not very good at it. It has nothing to do with it. It's the, what you're after is catching the mind and noticing the mind. That's when everything happens is in that moment. So it could be said that if you have a, a, a session, a 10 minute session where you feel like you're just running the whole time, pulling your mind back like a toddler in a toy store, um, you're getting a lot of repetitions in, so there's nothing. That's a good thing. You're getting, you know, you're getting more repetitions in, so your your strength is growing, your observer awareness is growing, and you have to also understand that um, in these, you know, this is life. It's a reflection of what your mind is doing is a reflection of life. There's times when your mind is extremely active and agitated, and when it's in that state, if you're under stress, uh, things are bothering you you're going to find that you're running a lot because that's the state your mind is in. It's very agitated. But there'll be other times when you're very relaxed and laid back and you'll feel like your mind is pretty slowed down and you don't feel like you're working so hard. They're both normal and they're both a part of the process. So you, again, you don't judge. It's just a process that you do over and over again. And there is no mastery of it. It's not, it's like exercise. You know, that's what I've said, you know, many times you don't, master exercise you know you don't get to a point where you know what i'm i'm as good at exercising as i'll ever be so i don't need to do it anymore i mean that's <laughs> the way that it works it's this is a a part of of a healthy mind and and um a healthy spirit of being in control of your life and what you will find is you do this relatively quickly a couple of weeks or so you will start to notice that stuff doesn't bother you because you will not be in your thoughts so much. You will just be noticing your thoughts. You'll be noticing things that make you stress, but you will have, now you have a choice whether you want to let that thought flow because you're not in the thought. You're just noticing the thought. It's a, it's a, it sounds very subtle, but it's a very, very big shift in consciousness and experience. So like I said, it's free. Anybody can do it. It takes you about 10 minutes a day and you have to do that in order to accomplish anything that we're talking about uh, today or, um, or any kind of self growth. You can't do anything. If you, you can only change what you're aware of. And if you're not aware of what your mind is doing, you're just a puppet of whatever your mind is doing. Ah, uh, yeah, that's fantastic. And I um, really like the way you um, said that you have a choice uh, when you develop this observer within you. And uh, one of the examples I have is that uh, when I go riding my bicycle in the winter, I don't have any spikes on my wheels and uh, sometimes I fall and uh, I might uh, get wet and uh, the clothes and I might look very stupid and I know there's people around me, but I can actually observe that and uh, be amused by myself and the thoughts that are going around uh, becoming stressed. Yeah, well, that's the fun part of it because, you know, people say to me, you know, how do I develop more patience? And they're usually surprised when I say, well, the first thing you have to do is know when you're being impatient. And, and that sounds like a silly thing. But in fact, what happens is most people don't notice they're impatient. They're just feeling impatient. There's a big difference. You know, when you're feeling impatient, you're just impatient. When you're feeling impatient and you notice that, then you have the opportunity to say, um, I'm having an impatient thought. 
and that is not going to serve my happiness or my performance, so I need to let it go and focus on something that will. That See, that's the choice that you get. We've all watched people behaving in a way that is very bad uh, or embarrassing for them, and they're completely unaware of it. They're just in their behavior, and it's the same thing that we're talking about here. You really begin to gain self-control and self, what we, we could call self-awareness by this simple process of sitting by yourself for 10, 10 minutes a day. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing those effects. I can just, you could just take a step back and uh, suddenly observe everything that's happening around you without being detached, uh, attached to um, what's happening. Well, you just described it when you said, you know, you take your bike ride and then you fall. Um, when you do that, the ego has a response to that, which is I'm embarrassed or I feel silly or something, but that's not you. And that's why I'm saying what this thought awareness training does, what um, these sessions do, is it makes you notice that. You notice, oh, look, I'm, I'm having these thoughts, but you won't feel embarrassed. You just notice the embarrassing thoughts. It's, that's why I say it's very difficult to describe the experience to someone, but once they experience it, then it becomes a knowing to them. And then the value of it is very plain. The experience of it builds a, um, it builds a confidence in the, in the whole idea. And then you want to invest more time, you become more motivated because you go, you know, this is a much better way to go through my day than the way I was doing it before. And so then you see a purpose of sitting down for 10 minutes a day, you wanna do it. Plus the other thing that happens is, as a byproduct is, your thoughts will thin out. As you become more present in your, um, in your activities, your mind will slow down and you will have access to your complete consciousness because it's only dealing with what's in front of it. It's not being spread out over all these extraneous thoughts that have actually nothing to do with the, the task that is in front of you. So that's the reason why performance goes up and f the fatigue factor goes way down because your mind isn't doing all these um, all this other calculations in um, in the background while you're trying to write a report or you're trying to um, figure uh, make a decision about something uh, it, it's really most people they they miss so much of what's happening because they're not fully present in the in the moment that it is happening mm, yeah that's amazing and uh, maybe this is uh, relevant to another thing I wanted to ask you uh, I really like this story you wrote about the chariot rider and his four horses. Can you tell us about the message you wanted to convey through that story? Yes, it, it's an ancient story. Um, I, I don't know whether it came around in the Roman times, but that's really kind of the visual of it is that there's a, um, a chariot rider who has four horses drawing the chariot. And the difference between um, if you were to say there, there's two there's two scenarios that we can have. One is that the horses represent the mind. That's basically what the horses rep uh, represent. The chariot rider represents us. And when the chariot rider is just holding on to the railings of the chariot, the horses are all going in different directions. They're going, some, one horse wants to go this way, the other one wants to go that way. So there's absolutely no focus on what the mind is doing. The horses are just running and they're reacting to all sorts of diff different situations and the person in the chariot is just going off for the ride, uh, which is not a very pleasant experience because they're not on the path, they're bumping over ruts and everything else. When the chariot rider has control of the reins, then the horses are focused, the, the energy of the horses are focused and he is in control of that power, the power of the horses. He is in control of the forward motion, the direction, and um, he gets to his destination. The ride is so much smoother. It's much more pleasant. With it's what it goes back to what I said. When we're in the present moment and we're in control of our mind, not the other way around, then we we accomplish so much more in a lot less time. The experience is much more pleasant, uh, and our performance goes ways up. So it's it's basically telling that story. Oh, so uh, very practically, is this like looking through the lens of multitasking, having emails and notifications go off uh, when the undisciplined driver, or was it something else? No, and um, an interesting thing there, the, the word multitasking, you know, we know now that the, the mind does not multitask. It's what it does is it's now called switch tasking. 
So here's a simple test you can do. I didn't come up with this test. Uh, when I had a, a radio show a number of years ago, I had an author on there called, uh, his name was Dave Crenshaw, and he wrote a book called The Myth of Multitasking. And what he said was that he didn't discover the information, he just gathered all this data and wrote about it. But there's a simple test that you can do, and he talks about it in his book, which is you write the sentence, uh, multitasking is worse than a lie. It could be any sentence, but this is, this is the sentence that he gives. And uh, it's an excellent book, by the way. Um, when you when you write this sentence, instead of just writing multitasking is worse than a lie, you write the letter M, and underneath of it, you write the number one, and then you write the letter U, and then the number two, and then the letter L. So you number each letter as you write it, and you go across the page like this, and you time this with the um, with a stopwatch. Um, then. When you finish that, you go back and then you just write the sentence, multitasking is worse than a lie. And then you write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up until you've counted all the numbers. So the very first time you do it, let's just say when you get to the end of the line, you have 35 letters in that sentence. So the second time you do it, you just write the sentence and then you write one through 35 underneath of it. Well, what you find when you do that is that your performance, the time it takes, uh, drops by, it depends on the person, but it's like 35, 40%. Um, and the reason for that is that the mind has to stop. Every time you write the letter M and then you switch over to writing a number, the mind has to stop and restart. And so it's doing stop, start, stop, start. That's why they call it switch tasking. It's switching from one task to another task. Whereas when it's writing the sentence out straight, it's just doing one task. When it's writing the numbers out str straight, it's just doing one task. So these are this is th that shows us, that's a simple example of how we are working our minds to death with all these things that are going on simultaneously and we think we're getting more done that that's the reason why this whole that whole concept is is it um is really dead and i think that the the idea what they're finding now in in the corporate america is they're you know if they want to in, increase performance they're going to have to start working on mindfulness uh, having people function in the present moment because that's the that's the key to getting more performance out of people, but not burning them out. You know, the, the, instead of burning them out, their their performance goes up, but their their feeling, their experience of their day is um, is one of much less fatigue. They're much more. They're happier. Uh, they're at peace. There's a whole. The, the benefits are incredible, and it, you can look at that like um, in sports psychology when. The golfers first started doing it was really Jack Nicholas, uh, in my opinion, who started this whole idea of the pre-shot routine and visualizing the shot and all these types of things. Uh, initially, that was really out of the box, but he's still the best golfer in the history of the game. Uh, people, he was just very difficult to beat. Now, in the game of golf, all of the focus is on that. I mean, because once you reach a certain level in sports prowess, when you when you have a certain level of physical ability, the repeatability um, of that, the ability to repeat physical performance at, at the highest level com is, comes from the mind. It doesn't come from the body after that. So uh, that's so net what you're seeing, what they've proven in sports, I think is why you're seeing in the corporate world and everywhere else where they're saying, look, if we want we want to move to the next level we're going to have to go in this direction so that's why i say the switch tasking thing doesn't work it's not even called or the switch it doesn't work. the multitasking it's not even called multitasking anymore because our brain our mind is actually not doing more than one thing at one time it's just doing things in, in sequence so quickly that we think it's doing them at the same time but what we're really doing is tiring ourselves out <laughs> yeah, I really like the way you frame the multitasking to switch tasking and 30 to 40 percent. That's just insane. Isn't that like two work days a week? Yeah, it is. I mean, it, they, they said that, you know, what they're learning is that um, it, it's, it's difficult to get upper management. Um, you, you have to present them with hard, cold, documented facts in order for them to even entertain it because they, you know, I, I was interviewed one time by a magazine and the the, um, the guy really liked the idea of the archery story. Um, he said, that just makes so much sense to me. But then half an hour later in the interview, he said, all right, well, let, let me play the devil's advocate here. I'm, I'm the owner of a company and we make some sort of widget, he said, and you're telling me 
you want me to bring all my employees into this room and tell them I want them to focus on the present moment, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, uh, and that's going to increase our performance. And I reminded him, I said, well, you're the guy that said that you really thought the archery story made so much sense. And he said, yeah, you know, you're right. I did. I don't know why I forgot it so quickly, but that's what ends up happening. And I've, I've actually had discussions with people that uh, were the heads of companies and they're still stuck in this old paradigm of, you know, they've talked to me about coming and talking to the people uh, to change things. And they're like, okay, so you're going to come and within a week sales are going to go up this. No, it doesn't work that way. You know, like you have to change it. You're still stuck in that. I want sales to double and I want them to double this week. And um, you're not looking at th th this big picture that this is, we're changing paradigms here. And if you want to change paradigms, it's going to take some time because we have this behavior that we have repeated over and over and over. And it's going to take a while to get the whole company set up to function in a different way because everybody that works in the co company is scared to death. If they're not doing 15 things at once, they're going to get fired. So, um, but it, it's interesting. It's, it is happening that we're having this discussion, <laughs> you know, 25 years ago, we wouldn't be having this discussion. So it's, I, you know, I have been Skyped into, um, corporate boardrooms. I have been invited by capital investment firms to talk with through working lunches. It's, it's happening. It's not everybody doing it, but people are looking at it and they're, and what I think is interesting is just like in golf, you know, initially you weren't competitive unless you were doing this stuff. Now everybody does it. And that is really what's going to happen in the business world. There are people that are going to hang on to the old paradigm uh, and bleed, bleed their employees dry. Uh, and then there are other companies that are going to launch into this stuff and they're going to be miles ahead of those other companies. And those companies are going to be playing catch up. But it, because people are having the discussion now. Mm, yeah, that's incredible. And uh, there was one last thing I was uh, really curious about. Um, um, it was, uh, yeah, in the end of the book, you have the phrase, uh, all things of lasting and deep value require time and nurturing and come to us only through our own effort. Uh, can you tell us more about that in the context of spiritual growth and instant gratification? Well, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, you know, that, um, if you think about everything that's easy for you, it means nothing. Um, you know, when you look at, if you just compare it to something like a race, if I draw a line on the street with a piece of chalk and say, cross the line, that's the finish line. It means nothing. Why does it feel so good when you win a race? It's because of everything that went into preparing for the race and everything that you went through pushing yourself through the race. That's where, that's what people, we, you know, we know it on some level, but we always let go of it and we get, become attached to winning the race. And we, we don't realize that, uh, or we forget and, and don't remind ourselves that why does it feel so good? Why does it feel, and I, in fact, you know, I was giving a clinic to a bunch of um, uh, high school and college golfers one time. And I, I asked them this question. I said, why does it feel so good when you hit a good shot? And they're all talking amongst themselves, trying to come up with some complicated answer. And I said, it's because you've hit so many bad ones. And, you know, they, they thought all of a sudden it was like an aha moment for these, these kids. They were like, yeah, you're right. I said, if every time you pulled the club out of the bag, you hit a pure shot, you would be bored with it. I said, what do you do when you have a video game and you master it? And they always said at the same time, you get rid of it. I said, that's right. Why is that? I said, because you want something to be... Ideally, it's right at that threshold where you can almost do it, but you can't quite do it. And so you're really, it holds, you feel, you have the feeling, I can get this, I can do this, but you're not there yet. And that's the human spirit. The human spirit is, is programmed in its DNA to expand and grow all the time. That's why, why we don't live in caves anymore. I mean, you know, it's always, that's why we have all this great art and all the, the Sistine Chapel and, the, you know, the um, these sophisticated musical instruments and all these things have come from, there's, there's more, there's more I can do. I can figure out more. I can become more. That's why, you know, musicians and artists know all this. They, they surrender to the, um, the infinite nature of their art early on or else they quit. Because, see, you can look at the infinite nature as being, I'll never be as good as I can be. Well, that's it. There's two ways to interpret that. You know, that's right. You will never, you will never run out of things that can satisfy you more 
in your art of music or in, in life and anything else. You could look at that as this is endless or that can be a good thing, but it can also be a blessing. And for me, that's what it is. So it's when you be, can become centered on the process of living life, on the process of achieving your goals, instead of being a, so attached to the moment that you achieve the goal or acquire the thing, then you're always where you should be and you're enjoying everything that you're doing. It's, it, you know, it, it's not a fairy tale. I mean, it, it's something that has been proven out. I have certainly experienced it over and over. I experience it all the time. And you also find that you become, um, you know, when you find yourself struggling, when you find yourself and you will notice you are struggling as you develop your, your thought awareness, you will notice, I'm, I feel like I'm struggling. And when you feel that, that's a trigger for you. It's an indication that you are up, as I've said many times, you're up against a threshold. You're up against something personally that you're, you haven't mastered yet. So it's an opportunity for you to master that or, or to work on your process of mastering it. It's not necessarily that you're gonna master it in that moment. I think it's really important for people because um, you know, you can you can look at that. It can it can take away your confidence if you don't interpret it correctly. If you want to be good at singing in front of a thousand people, you got to get out in front of a thousand people to do that. You have to have that opportunity. If you don't, you can sit in your room and sing into the mirror all you want, but that's not the same as singing in front of a thousand people. There's a nervousness that comes from being in front of a lot of people, and that's because it's unfamiliar. You're gathering data, you're gathering gathering confidence, and you have to go through that experience multiple times to gain enough information uh, about how to handle your, your nerves and to feel the nervousness and get comfortable with that and for the technical barriers to drop away. And when I work with people in coaching, this, this is what we do is to teach them that it's not a bad thing because you're going into a situation that makes you uncomfortable or that you find yourself in a situation that makes you uncomfortable. It's not a bad thing, especially if you can separate yourself from the anxiety and the lack of confidence that you're feeling. You just notice them and you go, oh, they're a, you know, that's a sign to me that I'm experiencing a threshold. So now I can get to work and I'm glad I'm here because I can't get to work on this unless I'm in this situation. So it's um, that's why I say everything comes through this process of us doing things over and over again, this practice. And the reason that it means so much to us when we do accomplish a goal is because of what we we went through. And an easy visualization for that is if I stand on the stage and I give and I, and I bring somebody up out of the audience and I give them a tennis ball and I say, I want you to throw the ball out in the audience. And they're like, where? I don't care. Just throw it out in the audience. It means nothing. But if I put a trash can out there that's 18 inches in diameter and I say, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you some money if you can get the ball in the trash can. All of a sudden, the whole experience changes. Now it's difficult. It's a challenge. Their focus comes in. All these things begin to happen. There's a thrill involved with it. All these things happen that weren't there when it was easy. So that, that's why I say if you look at things that feel difficult, even difficult situations like, like say, a job interview, you know, when you feel like you're not really good, when you, when you have a job interview you don't feel like you're really good at, and then you have a job interview where you feel like you've really improved, it's it's a great it's just a wonderful feeling you feel like this sense of mastery like you know i'm really i'm really starting to nail this stuff i get it and your confidence goes up so that's why i say in order to perform better and to get to that point faster you need to learn to be in the present moment to not judge all these things that we're talking about mm. yeah that's really beautiful and uh, everything this uh, is connected the observer the present moment awareness and uh, all of this Everything is connected and it all starts with the thought awareness training. It, it's helpful in anything, just like if you're, if you want to learn how to play a musical instrument, it's helpful if you have somebody, if you have an observer watching you learn to develop your observer, because the way that we process our life, we have made it, it's a, it's a behavior that it's a, and it's a habit. It's a, um, that we have, um, we have practiced, over and over and over again and so it's it's very entrenched in how we process things and it's very helpful if you can have someone watching you giving you a plan 
um, this is what you're going to experience when you're in this situation. This is what I want you to try to do. And then after they go through that experience, then you talk to them. Okay, what were the thoughts that were running through your mind? And help them to see what they what they did right. And and really, I think as, as important as anything else, to see the wake behind the boat. I mean, so many times when people begin to improve themselves and empower themselves, wherever they are feels normal. You know, in other words, like, you know, when you first start out on, a, on the piano, you're just trying to figure out where the note on the paper is on the keyboard. You're not trying, you, 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 the concept of being able to play some difficult classical piece or improvise in jazz, that's just, that you're not even there. That's just way beyond where you're at. You're just trying to do the simple thing of where the note on the paper is, where it is on the keyboard. As you move forward, that falls behind. You don't have to do that anymore. You know where the notes are on the, on the instrument. And now your, your technique is beginning to develop. And now you're going to start judging your technique. You're going to be saying, well, I really want to play, be able to play this piece over here, piece A. And so you start working on that. As you finish that, now that feels normal to you. Now you're way beyond the, where the note is on, on the instrument, but, you're, but where you are now feels normal. And so you're now you're looking at something that's more difficult. And so what it's what I do when I work with people is let them constantly point that out that, OK, well, two weeks ago when we started, you were back here trying to figure out where the notes are on the paper. Now you're up here starting to do jazz improvisation and you're you're upset with yourself because you can't do the next level. But you've come this far and you need to notice that so that you can see that you are moving forward. Oh, yeah. So you can keep up the motivation over the long run and actually see that you are improving. That's right. And that, and sometimes it, um, it, it really does take someone outside of you who gets to know you a little bit to share that with you and to bring you back to that so that you can see what you're missing uh, about yourself. So you don't, you don't lose motivation, you don't lose confidence, and you also don't uh, in, in fully engage the book that the second book I wrote that came out in October. Um, there's a chapter about um, you know uh, creating your goals with accurate data, which is another thing that I work on with people. You know, people set goals and then they set unrealistic time frames for them, but they don't know they're unrealistic, and then they begin to judge their progress um, and their ability to accomplish a goal in general based on where they are on this completely inaccurate timeline. And you know, uh, so helping them to see that is really very important, and it um, it helps them to maintain their confidence and their motivation. Mm, yeah, that's amazing. And uh, I really look forward to read the book uh, myself, the Fully Engaged, uh, wasn't that right? Yes, yes. Yeah, perfect. And uh, to wrap this up, uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, what is the number one thing you do on a consistent basis? Maybe a habit or something you do Yeah, very often that you feel to get the most uh, bangs for the buck from? Well, I guess, you know, I don't want to be repetitive, but... I, I work on thought awareness every day. Um, I actually do much longer than 10 minutes, but 10 minutes is certainly sufficient when you're starting out because what I, I look at that as the key to the prison door. If I don't have that, that part of my, if I'm not aligned with the observer, then it's very easy for me to get sucked into the emotional content of situations or of thoughts, things that I might otherwise feel that I'm worrying about, uh, all those types of things, I feel like the more aligned I am with the observer, the more power that I have in terms of how I experience difficult situations. And, you know, some of that I can um, relate to being, you know, as a pilot, uh, you know, if I've said many times, you know, if the engine quits, you have two choices. You can scream all the way to the crash site or you can analyze the situation. You could be outside of the, the observer of the situation and go through an analysis of, look, this is what's happened. Here's my options. That's the way we all want to be. We know we all want to be that way. When we're in a situation when someone's either in our face and being unkind or, you know, I always ask myself, if I could handle this situation any way that I wanted, what would that be? Well, that's a conversation you can't have if you're just reacting to the situation. You have to be outside of the situation. And so for me, um, that's what thought awareness training does, and that's what it, that's the opportunity that it gives you. Mm, yeah, thank you very much, and uh, I totally agree. I always uh, do thought awareness training uh, uh, every morning. It's uh, my number one self care habit too. So uh, I um, and uh, to you who is listening, 
I uh, highly recommend The Practicing Mind. If you haven't read it, you can get a copy and feel inspired. Cultivate focus and discipline in your life. Tom, thank you so much. And I'm very excited to be connected. Oh, me too. I'm so appreciative to you for having me on the show. Thank you so much.